Axiom is a mod that has been revolutionizing the way we build in Minecraft, allowing us to do all different kinds of things, from huge terraforming projects to very small detailing with display entities. My name is Calvin, and in the last few months I've been creating all different kinds of tutorials covering the most important tools and features from the mod. However, with a mod as large as Axiom, there are many tools and techniques that I never got to show you. So in this video we will cover 13 useful tips and tricks from Axiom that you can use to greatly improve your building abilities with the mod. So without further ado, let's get started. If we press left alt, we will open this menu where I want you to pay attention to these two functionalities. We have replace mode on one side and no clip on the other. With the no clip, what you can do is move through blocks, which is amazing, but sometimes you just want to land on the solid block beneath and doing the whole thing of switching is not optimal. So the tip here is to keybind these tools so that you can quickly toggle them on and off while building. To do so, you have to go to the Options menu, Controls, Keybinds, and scroll down until you find Axiom. Here you will find all the capabilities, by default it will be bound to nothing, I have it set to the letter U, and the other one that I got keybinded is Toggle Replace Mode to the letter Y. And with that on, we can replace blocks without having to break them like we would normally do. But it won't allow you to place new blocks, so it's important to be able to toggle it on and off quickly. This next one is one of the tools that I never got to show in my previous tutorial and it's called the Symmetry tool, or Setup Symmetry. What we do with this is we right click on any place to create the symmetry point. You can choose the corner between four blocks, the middle between two adjacent blocks, or the center of a block. You can also hold Ctrl and scroll the mouse wheel to move it in any direction, and with Delete we can get rid of it. With this what we can do is hit Ctrl F to flip or Ctrl R to rotate. Ctrl F will change depending on the direction that we are facing. So let's say we hit Ctrl F and now two arrows will appear in the direction we were facing. So now if we place a block, it's going to mirror it on the other side of the symmetry point. If we go in the middle, we can see that it won't do anything. And this also works for breaking blocks. And the cool thing is that this is mirroring or flipping the direction, making it symmetrical. Now let's say we not only want to flip in this direction, we can hit Ctrl F facing the other directions as well to add another set of arrows. So now this is going to flip and place all around our symmetry point. And if we want, we can move the symmetry point up and flip in the vertical direction as well. Now instead of flip, we said that we could also do Ctrl R to rotate, which is shown by these green lines, and setting the symmetry point in a corner of blocks with this is very useful to create quick floor patterns with glazed terracotta or any other block really, and this is something very fun to play around with. There are some game rules specific to Axiom. One of them is called Axiom Do Block Gravity. Setting that one to false can be incredibly useful when we are building entirely in creative, because as the name says, it's going to prevent blocks that are affected by gravity from falling down. This is especially useful if you are using World Edit alongside Axiom because in reality you can achieve the same effect with the freeze updates toggle from Axiom. So let's try and set back the game rule to true, and as you can see, the blocks will still keep floating. But the problem comes when we affect any of its surrounding with something like World Edit, that is going to trigger the updates and then everything is going to fall down, even if we have the freeze updates. So, if you are planning to build with something like this, you will want to have that game rule set to false, and not worry about breaking your build. Along the same lines of building in creative, you can toggle Tinker and Freeze Updates on, and then right-click with your fist on the different blocks to change their state, similarly to what we can do with the debug stick. For instance, you can click on top of the fence gates to move them down as if they were connected to walls, and on top of that we can install the following resource pack called Krista's Better Walls. I'll put the link in the description. To show this, let me turn it off. So for instance, with four walls connected, if we lower the top, it's going to take the corners away, but leave these weird holes that don't look good at all. The resource pack fixes that, and now it looks a hundred times better. Of course, all of this won't work in survival builds, but I think it's important knowledge to share in case anyone wants to unlock the full potential of these tools and have as much freedom in creative as they want. 
Let's say we have something like that and how to rotate or mirror this is a question that I've seen a lot, so let's quickly go over the different ways of doing that. If we use the move tool and select the entire thing, we can scroll to begin moving it and in the right corner we will see that we get a hint indicating Ctrl R to rotate. This will rotate the entire thing 90 degrees in the clockwise direction. And we can also do Ctrl F to flip it, which will depend on the direction we are facing. So mixing these two you should be able to place your shapes in whatever orientation that you want. But this is a way to do this with the build capabilities. To do the things in the editor mode, first we need to enter it with right shift and select the build that you want to rotate or mirror. We then can press Ctrl X to cut it and begin moving it. From there we can rotate it in any specific direction by dragging the different handles around, which to me is the most visual and recommended way of doing it. And to flip it, it's in the exact same way as before, just hit Ctrl F facing the direction that you want. And then just press Enter to confirm. Continuing with the editor mode accessed with right shift, we've seen how to select with the magic selection. One tip here is, let's say that this is not just acacia but it also has oak and we still want to select the entire thing. We could select each part separately, which would be more complicated if we have more blocks. So what you want to do here is change this option from block to any and now it's going to select everything with one click. Another thing with selections is that as you can see, especially with shaders, we can't see anything. Without shaders it's way better, we only have a yellow line, but when the build or the selection is larger or more intricate it can still be very intrusive to have that yellow line all around. So a good thing to do here is to hide the selection, for which we can go up here into view and we can see that it says show selection. I got this key binded to Ctrl T, but by default it's not going to be key binded to anything, and I recommend you do that because it's incredibly useful, especially for painting your builds without affecting the surroundings while still being able to see what you're doing. So to keybind it, you need to go up here to keybind and under view you will find the show selection option. Just click there and choose whatever key or key combination that you want for it. Here under operations we have a bunch of useful things to do, but I'm just going to focus on a few that are more useful and not as clear to apply. The first one I want to show is the Generate Color Field. This is something that Grian showed how to use in one of his recent Hermitcraft videos, but he didn't quite say how to create them with Axiom. And it's pretty easy actually. So to do that what you need to do is first make a box selection somewhere empty and hit enter. So once you are seeing that yellow outline, go to operations and now click Generate Color Field. That's going to create the color field for us depending on the size of our selection. So make it smaller if you want the colors to be closer to each other, but that might skip certain blocks. So in general, larger is better. So now to pick your colors, you would go in a straight line between the two blocks that you want to connect, grabbing the different ones to make your gradient. And something very useful for larger gradients especially is to use the ruler tool between the two blocks. That's going to set up a line that then you can use as a guide and then you can just grab the colors or the blocks that are closer to that line until you reach your final block. And that way you can very easily create these very large gradients. Now let's move to auto shading. For this I'm using the most recent version of Axion which is 3.0 where the auto shade operation has some new features. So here I have a mounting that I created to show this. The way auto shade works is pretty simple. We need to select what we want to paint, we can hide it as we learned before, choose your parameters and just click down here, and that's going to paint our build casting shadows and lights depending on where our play is located. So for instance, if we are over here, the result will be different. Instead of player position, we can have a specific sun angle if that's what you want, and also we can have ambient occlusion, which as you can see with that turned off, the holes and small indentations of the terrain won't get darker. Now, the new and cool thing added in this version is that we can set more than one lysers with custom positions. So if we go ahead and remove the first one, it's going to be automatically set to our current location. So you can move and then delete it to set the first light source exactly where you want it and then move around and add other points, like here where I am adding two more points closer and from below. Once they are set, you can do auto shade and we can see the results where the front is very illuminated by three lights and the back is very dark without any light source at all. So now let's add a few ones there and see how it changes. Also, you can change the intensity of each light source. 
For example, with the three first original ones, we can send the higher one as the main light source and the other two with less intensity. So we still get like this general shading direction, but the spots in the front are not super dark. And one more thing is that we so far have been using the automatic palette, which tends to work pretty good and you can even customize some settings. But also we can add a custom palette here, for instance this one going from sandstone to terracotta. Click auto shade and now the mountain will be painted with that. Although I don't know if you can notice, but it used the darker color as the brighter one. So it's important the order in which you place the palette. The brighter should be at the bottom of the list for the result to make more sense. And we can also go ahead and change the percentages as well, where I will generally use the brighter in small quantities as a highlight, and the same for the darkest ones as a shadow. Now what we are going to see is the smooth snow operation, and this does what you think it does. It puts a smooth layer of snow over the terrain. The trick comes with the tool masks, because in general we don't want to put snow everywhere, so we can use an angle mask from here, let's say 90 with a range of 20, and with that mask on we can select the terrain with a freehand selection for example, and that's only going to select the areas that are relatively flat. So once we get the selection we can use a smooth snow and that should work fairly well, but there might be some cases and areas where the transition is a bit harsh. So what we can do to improve that is go up here to select and click expand. There we can choose how many blocks we want to expand our current selection. With two or one it should be good enough for the transitions to be smoother. Also we can even smooth the selection out with this up here if we want. And finally just hit a smooth snow to get your final snow layer and that's it. Now the last of the operations we will be seeing is the animated rebuild for which we are going to take a look at these colored cubes. We have to select the thing first and then go to Operations Animated Rebuild. This window will open up with a bunch of parameters that look a bit scary at first, but if we just click here we can see it will start an animation of our build that begins at the center. The way to change the starting point is by using structure blocks. To get those in game we need to use the following command slash give your username structure block and then just place them wherever you want the animation to begin. Make sure it is inside the same selection, for which you can use expand selection again for example. And that should work and begin from the corner where we place the structure block. If we want to repeat it, we may notice that the structure block is gone, so what we can do is hit Ctrl C to undo, and the block should reappear. And that's something that you can also use in case the animation breaks your build. For instance here I will hit the button two times without letting it finish, so we can see how the animation gets all broken. It's important to be very patient with this operation, just let it finish. But in case something goes wrong, do Ctrl C to undo and wait. See what happens, make sure it's not trying to do anything else and then undo again until you get your build back. Now let's take a look at the list of parameters. These are used to control the speed of the animation, the randomness and the direction. We can use the primate settings like horizontal sheets, so you can see how we change the horizontal multiplier to 0 and vertical multiplier to 1. That's going to create layer by layer from the bottom to the top. If you want the animation to be faster, we can reduce the first two parameters all the way to 0. Setting the same block delay to the maximum and different block to zero, you can see it's going to take longer to finish each stripe of different colors. And the other way around is going to create a stripe by a stripe like layers, because all the blocks of the same type don't have a delay. And the random extra delay just adds a degree of randomness to the animation. In general, just play around with the different parameters to get the animation that you want. And consider the same and different block delays, because depending on your build and the orientation of it, like in this case with the vertical and horizontal stripes, the same parameters will give opposite results. This is the tool I used to create this scene of me walking on a bridge while it was building itself. So you really can use this tool in very creative ways. But if you're looking for a more detailed explanation about this and its parameters, I will put the link to a tutorial from Ashes Den, which explains everything very clearly. This next tip is something that I always recommend, especially for organics and structures, which is having a reference picture to follow. And something that some of you may not know is that there's a way of opening them inside of Axiom itself by going to File, Open Reference Image. 
that's going to open up your system menu. In this case, it opened the hide map brushes folder. So my recommendation is here under Axiom, create a carpet called reference pictures, where you add every image that you use. So you can always easily access everything. Then you just need to click the one that you want, open it, and it will appear small in the top left corner of your game. You can then move it to wherever you want and drag the corner to make it larger. You can load multiple images if you want at the same time, and also you can right click and tick show in-game overlay, so when we close the Axiom Editor mode it's going to stay there until we tick the option off or just close it. Up next we have here some houses that I made for one of my large builds, and now we will see how to paste them around in a large quantity quickly. First we need to select every build individually, for which we will use the box selection, but you can do whatever you prefer. Once it's selected we copy it with Ctrl C and then press Ctrl P to save it as a blueprint. Choose a name to identify it and pressing save it will open up the blueprint folder where you want to save them. And that's it. Then you just need to repeat that for every house or assets that you want to paste around. So now we can go over to the stamp tool, and down here there's this button that says add blueprint. That's going to open your blueprint folder. You can also go to open folder down here if you are not sure where it's pointing to and select the right folder where you saved your blueprints. So now you just add as many as you want. This one, for instance, that is a very large house, I want it to be pasted less times, so I just have to lower that percentage and so on. So we now just click around with a big brush radius and it's going to make a mess of houses. If that's what you want, go for it. But what we need to do to fix this is to increase the minimum spacing. So now they are going to be more spread out. Then we have here the deferred option which, in case you need to be more picky about the placement of the blueprints, this will allow you to then move them individually before actually pasting them with enter. Then we have the random orientation options. Generally, we would want to keep this on, so the same houses have different rotations. We can also tick extend to ground on, for instance here it's all flat terrain, but if we have some variation, what this is going to do is automatically extend the bottom layer until it touches another block. This might add some weird things in certain cases, but that depends on the blueprints themselves. And one last useful thing comes with mixing the stamp tool with the tool masks. For example, let's say we want to have a cluster of houses in different places, but nothing in the middle. For that, we can use a Lua script. And I know this is more complicated, but all we really need is one of the pre-made examples. Here we have one that is simplex noise, and this tends to work very well. It's something like what we got in the noise painter. So now the stamp tool is going to work in that way. You can see how we get that same noise pattern in the floor. So for example, we can change these numbers, like the scale to 20, and now we can see how the blobs get larger. We can reduce the threshold to add more empty spaces, and so on. But in general, combining these two tools can be very powerful to achieve the result that you want faster. This next one is one of the most recent additions to Axiom. Let's first create something over here that could be like the size shape of a hot air balloon, for example. Now we select it and go to Modify. Here we have as a first option Revolve. With that, we can choose the axis in which it will revolve around and then right click on the center point, and you can see the result is going to be something like that, which is a bit chunky, but it might be very useful in certain cases. We can also see in the preview a green and red ring, these are showing us the outer and inner boundary of our selection. We can also choose rotate copies. This is going to work in a similar way, but it's going to be a bit more customizable and allow us to create more fancy and weird stuff. Here we can choose the amount of copies and the angle. By default, it's set to equidistant, and choosing the center point with that, we can see that we get very quickly the frame for the hot air balloon. And then it's pretty easy from here to fill it in by hand or even using this same tool. It's in overall a very cool and useful tool to create symmetrical things. Then we also have translate copies. This works in a similar way to the stack tool. We select and choose how much we want the build to move in each direction, and how many copies we want to create. Then right-click and it will place them. You can use a relative positioning or an absolute one. 
where it will translate the bill the exact amount of logs that you indicate, allowing it to overlap, which is very interesting to create patterns, for instance. Then we can grab all of this and use Revolve from the center point and in the interior we are going to have that very intricate pattern. And that's it, we can even paint it with a spherical gradient to make it look even cooler. One last thing from here is the twist tool. Let's say we have this stone rectangle. The twist, by default, will twist it 45 degrees across the y direction. One useful case of this is this one where I have some very simple chains and we can twist them to give them a more interesting look. We can also rotate copies to get different chains in different orientations that we can then just copy and use wherever we need them. And finally, with twist, what we can do is to play around with the different angles and the different directions. By default, it's only going to twist along the y axis, but if we also add the one in the x direction, for example, we can get these very interesting shapes that even if they look a bit broken, it's a great start for these carving positions that tend to be very hard to make. Of course, the more you twist, the more deformed it will look, and in general this is something that works way better with large scale things. The last tip is a part of the shape tool that I never showed when I was covering organics. For example, here I have the frame for some wings that I'm working on. Under shapes, we can create spheres, cylinders, and so on. But here, instead of solid, we will choose modeling. Let's grab another block and make sure to tick keep existing. And with this, we can start adding points of a surface following the frame and that's going to fill in the wings. It takes some time to figure out which surface type you need for each application case and how exactly they work, but in general this is an amazing and fast tool to create surfaces in cases like this. I leave that up to you to play around and see what you find better for your own building process and style. After this we can use the lasso select with the tool mass of gold to continue polishing the shape of the wing, smooth it out and so on. And you can see that from the other side it's looking amazing with the diamond wireframe coming out of it. Then it's just a matter of adding the details and painting. Something like this could be the end result for instance. We can copy one wing and flip it so we will have both symmetrical wings. And if we want them to have a more interesting orientation for our organic, we can use at this scale the twist tool along different directions for example. Then we can even go here to unlock rotation and rotate them in any angle that we want to make sure that they make sense for whatever shape our organic may have. And we can end up with something like that, for example. And with that, we are done with the 13 tips and tricks for Axiom. If you have any others that I don't know of, please leave them in the comments if you want so that I can make a part 2 with them in the future. I hope you found these ones useful, this has been Calvin, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.